We make things. We use our hands, minds, and machines to build, to fix, to improve. We're known as do-it-yourselfers, home improvement fans, fix-it fanatics, inventors. At our core, though, we're all makers. So let's jump in and make something. Hi, I'm Ron Hazelton. Welcome to the show. Now today we're going behind the scenes to see what's involved in replacing an aging central air conditioning system with a new state-of-the-art model. We'll find out step-by-step step what's involved in a first-rate professional installation and learn about some of the outstanding features and benefits of a modern air conditioning system. Let me put it this way, they do a whole lot more than just cool the air. Then I'll show you how to bring new life to a dingy deck in just a day. That's right, a single day to clean, brighten, seal, and stain your deck. Talk about immediate gratification. And finally, there are many ideas about how to seal used caulking tubes, preserving the contents for use later. Most don't work all that well, but here's one that does. Last night, my central air conditioning system began making a very loud noise. Today, it's even worse. And I've decided that rather than wait for it to fail, I'm gonna go ahead and replace it now. Encon Heating and Air Conditioning is a company with an excellent reputation here in Southern Connecticut. I've asked service manager Rick Krasinski to drop by and make a recommendation. After looking things over, Rick suggests that since my system is nearly 15 years old, that I replace it with something much quieter and more energy efficient. Rick points out that a central air conditioning system consists of an outside condenser, an inside air handler, ductwork to carry the cool air to room vents, and an air return vent and ducts to bring warmer air back for recooling. He also points out that it's important to properly size the air conditioner to the space being cooled. To take advantage of the most energy efficient system, I'll need to replace both the condenser and the air handler, plus a bit of ductwork. To learn what's state of the art, I decide to visit the TRAIN website. I come to a decision and a couple of weeks later, ENCON service technicians Dan Sorelic and Bob Karipsky show up to begin work. Dan gets busy right away removing the refrigerant from the old system. The gas is actually drawn out by a vacuum pump and stored under pressure in a tank. Then he and Bob disconnect the lines and remove the old condenser. Next, the soil where the new unit will sit is compacted and a new lightweight precast concrete pad is set in place and checked for level. Earlier that day, the new air conditioning system was delivered, and now it's time to set the condenser in place. Next, Dan and Bob begin removing the old air handler in the basement. We've decided to install the air handler horizontally in order to accommodate additional equipment that will be part of the new system. A high efficiency air filter, a humidifier, and a dehumidifier. With this in mind, Dan and Bob begin building a base. Cement blocks will carry the weight. These are then concealed with sheet metal covers. Sound and vibration absorbing pads are set atop the covers and a drip pan is placed on the pads. Smaller blocks are placed inside the pan. More insulating pads are put on top. Finally, the air handler is brought in and set in place. The high efficiency filtration system is housed in this case. Crane calls their version clean effects. The various filter mediums will remove up to 99.98% of particles from the filtered air, such as dust, pollen, bacteria, pet dander, mold spores, and smoke. With the air handler in place, it's time to begin installing the ductwork. You'll notice that all of the new duct is wrapped in an insulating material on the outside. Now this has an insulating bubble core sandwiched between two layers of aluminum foil. 
and reflects 97% of radiant heat. The ductwork closest to the air handler also has interior insulation. Designed to control noise and further reduce cooling loss, this foam rubber is specially treated with an antimicrobial agent to prevent the growth of mold and bacteria. Nice, nice. This insulator prevents noise and vibration from being transmitted from the air handler's motor and fan into the ductwork. Each section of ductwork is secured to the necks with long strips of bent sheet metal called drivers. As the strips are driven in, they pull the sections tightly together. Encon Custom makes nearly all of its ductwork in their own shop. The sweeping curve on these elbow sections, for example, improves airflow and further reduces noise. Once the sections are connected together, the joints are sealed with metallic tape. The exterior insulation is lapped over the joint, then it too is secured with tape. These branch ducts deliver air to individual vents. Most are outfitted with dampers to control airflow. This type of ducting uses adjustable elbows that can be set to just about any angle. The metal duct is then connected to sections of insulated flexible ductwork using plastic ties secured with screws. Next, Dan cuts away a section of insulation from the return air duct. Then Bob removes a rectangular piece of sheet metal leaving an opening into which he sets a connector or collar. The collar is held in place by bending over tabs on the inside of the duct. Next, a straight section is attached to the collar, connecting the return air supply to the incoming side of the air handler. On the opposite side of the air handler, Dan creates an opening in the supply duct into which another collar is installed. This opening is for the humidifier that will help keep humidity at the proper level during winter months when otherwise dry air can be uncomfortable as well as unhealthy. The system also has a dehumidifier that will extract excess moisture from the air supply during the summer cooling season. The dehumidifier is connected to the main system using round ductwork that is fabricated on site. It's first cut to length, then rolled into a cylinder. A crimper is used to secure the seam and to reduce the diameter of the duct enough so that it can slip inside an adjoining section. As we've seen, central air conditioning systems like this one have an outside condenser compressor and an inside air handler. A refrigerant collects heat from the indoor unit and releases it through the outdoor unit. The refrigerant is carried between the two components in a sealed loop of copper tubing and pipe. All the fittings must be made completely leak-proof with high temperature solder. With the pipes thoroughly sealed, Dan attaches a vacuum pump and, once the air has been removed from the lines, begins to fill the system with refrigerant. Now let's face it, I had to replace my air conditioner because my old unit was on its last legs. But in the process, I got a lot more than a mere replacement. My new air conditioner operates so quietly I can barely tell that it's running and it uses a fraction of the energy that my old system did. And there's another bonus. 
Did you know that the air inside an average home is four to five times worse than the outdoor air when it comes to dust, mold, and other troublemakers? But the whole house air filter in this train clean effects unit does a good job of getting rid of that bad stuff. It filters out 99.98% of allergens, particles, pollen, smoke, and even bacteria. In fact, this filtering system is 100 times more effective than the standard one inch filter found in most home central systems. Yep, modern air conditioning like this does a whole lot more than just cool the air. You know, even a deck that's as dingy, dirty, and discolored as this one is only one day away from rejuvenation. Let me show you how. The secret to making this a one-day process is this water-based system from Thompson's. There's no need to let the wood dry between steps. We're going to begin with a deck cleaner. This is a concentrate, so I'll first add two quarts of warm water to my deck sprayer, then the cleaner. A thorough stirring is a good idea. Then I screw on the top and pump up a little pressure. I apply the cleaner by keeping the nozzle about a foot from the surface and moving back and forth in smooth, even strokes, overlapping each one. Now the idea here is to thoroughly wet the surface, but to avoid pooling. If it's a warm or breezy day, you may need to go back and reapply the cleaner. Work smaller areas at a time, say 20 or 30 square feet. Allow the cleaning solution to sit on the surface for about 10 minutes. Then, using a synthetic bristle brush, give the wood a good scrubbing. Now, you don't need to use a lot of pressure. Just agitate the cleaner and work it well into the surface. Now, I rinse off the cleaning solution with a garden hose and high-pressure nozzle. If I were working on the lawn, I'd pre-wet the grass to help dilute the liquid being washed off. You know, it's amazing how much of the darkness and dinginess on a deck comes just from dirt. Now, this is a piece of lumber from the same decking section, and you can see how much different it looks from this deck, and that's just the result of a good cleaning. Now, this next step, brightening, might be considered optional on some decks. What it does is sort of make the entire deck a little bit lighter and even up differences between boards like these two. The brightener is mixed the same way as the cleaner. Warm water first, then the concentrate, followed by a thorough stirring. I can apply the brightener while the deck is still damp from the cleaning. No need to wait around while it dries. Again, I spray the solution in long, even overlapping strokes to a small area and give the mixture time to do its work. After 10 minutes or so, I re-wet the deck using a mist setting on the nozzle. Then do another light scrubbing to work the brightener well into the surface of the wood. Now it's rinse time again. Well, our deck's been cleaned, lightened, or brightened. Now it's ready for some protection. Today I'm going to be using a water-based product that will not only seal the deck, but also add back some color. Now here I'm going to pour the solution into a painting tray because my favorite way to apply a sealer to a deck is with a large applicator pad made just for the purpose, like this one from Sherline. I dip the pad in the sealer, work off the excess by passing the pad over the ridges in the pan, then begin applying the material in straight strokes, moving with the wood grain. As I apply the stain and sealer, I'm doing several things. Protecting the deck from water and damaging UV sun rays, enabling it to better repel dirt, and of course, making it more attractive. From dark, dirty, and dingy to downright handsome and weatherproof, and in less than a day. That's what I really like about this water-based system. Now 
Now most home improvement jobs like this leave me with a partially used tube of caulk or sealant. Now I've tried a variety of ways of sealing these up so that they're ready for another use with mixed results. I've tried electrical wire nuts, but they tend to leak air. I've used duct tape, but that too allows the caulk to dry out inside. And then of course there's the technique of putting a nail or a screw into the open end of the nozzle. Both of these though have led to disappointing results. Enter the Red Cap Caulk Saving Sealer. These come in packs of 15 or 35 and are very simple to use. Just place the capper over the cut end of the used caulking tube. Unroll it an inch or so. Pull the end of the capper away from the nozzle tip and squeeze a small amount of caulk or sealant out the end. Just enough to form an airtight plug. When you're ready to use the tube again, simply pull off the capper. When it comes to outlining and defining flower beds and gardens, edgers are what you need. Here are some styles to choose from and some tips on how to install them. Begin by defining the bed using an edger or flat garden spade to trim and shape the sod. Next, use a pick or mattock to loosen the soil at the edge of the bed. Then, with a garden trowel, remove enough dirt to make a shallow trench. And finally, tamp down the bottom of the trench with a block of wood and a hammer or sledge. Since edging blocks follow the natural rise and fall of the terrain, they don't necessarily need to be level, but they do need to be straight and even. After driving in stakes, set a block in place at each end of the section and stretch twine across the top. Set the remaining blocks in position and tap them with a mallet to get them flush with each other and even with the twine. Next, backfill behind the blocks and compact the soil with a tamper or your foot. If you have gaps in the front, fill and compact those too. Some edging blocks, like these, have interlocking edges. The installation procedure, though, is virtually the same. Other styles, like this simulated Belgian block, don't interlock at all and are set more on top of the ground than into a trench. For circular beds, like those around trees, these curved blocks are a perfect solution. Edgers do for a garden or flower bed what a frame does for a picture. Makes everything look just a little more finished. To view today's projects again, visit ronhazelton.com. Step-by-step home improvement tips when you need them. Let Ron show you how to do it yourself.